Former President Trump's criminal trial in New York continued today. Here he is just a few minutes ago. This gag order is not only unique, it's totally unconstitutional. But you have a judge who's totally conflicted, totally, absolutely conflicted, that he's rushing this case through. In former President Trump's criminal trial today, the prosecution called a series of witnesses who helped them introduce more evidence about the so-called hush money payments. One of the witnesses detailed the negotiation with Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen. We now turn to our legal correspondent, Arlene Richards, who's at the courthouse with the latest. Arlene, a lot of activity in the courthouse today. I hear the prosecution called four witnesses to the stand. What can you tell us about their testimony? Well, first, Jack, breaking news, a full panel of appellate judges have denied former President Trump's motion to delay the trial. His attorneys had asked the court to delay the trial until after they heard appeals on their claims of presidential immunity and to recuse Judge Juan Mershon. Now to the trial. First up this morning was Michael Cohen's former banker, Gary Farrow. Now, Farrow testified that he helped Cohen to open an account that was eventually used to pay Stormy Daniels $130,000. He testified that Michael Cohen told him the account would be used for real estate consulting and that if he knew it would be a shell account, he never would have opened it. On cross-examination, he testified that he never directly spoke to Trump and that he had no reason to believe that Cohen would be involved in any political activity. Now, other witnesses this morning were an executive director for C-SPAN Archives and a field director for a court reporting company. Their testimony was only less than 20 minutes, but it was used to show the jury videos and transcripts of Trump admitting that he had made disparaging remarks about women in an Access Hollywood tape. Now, Arlene, the prosecution ended the day with testimony of Stormy Daniels' attorney, Keith Davidson. What were some of the more compelling moments in his testimony? Well, what stands out for me with Keith Davidson's testimony is the conversations he said he had with Michael Cohen. Now, Keith Davis represented Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal over their deals to keep quiet about affairs they say they had with Trump, which Trump denies. He said that Stormy Daniels' story wasn't that interesting until after the Access Hollywood mm -hmm. tape was released, and then it skyrocketed. Now, the National Enquirers had already made a deal with Stormy Daniels' agent, but then the National Enquirer dropped out of the deal, and they connected him with Michael Cohen. He said he never really wanted to deal with Michael Cohen because conversations with him were always contradictory. But he did eventually talk to Michael Cohen and they made a deal. But he said the deal was that he was supposed to make the payment by October 14th, 2016. But Cohen didn't make the payment on that date. And after several days, Davidson told him the deal was off and that he no longer represented Stormy Daniels. He said Michael Cohen complained that he couldn't get a hold of his guy. And then he eventually said, I'll just do it myself. So Cohen did eventually make the payment of $130,000. Now, Davidson said that he later spoke to an editor at the National Enquirer who told him that Trump was tight. And he said that he thought that meant that Trump really didn't have the money. Now, all of this testimony today was to provide evidence to the jury that Trump made this $130,000 hush money payment and also, I think, to convince them that Trump probably did have those affairs. Back to you. Arlene, thank you for that information. Good to see you. Now, the Heritage Foundation's oversight project is seeking more information on the Manhattan DA's case against Trump. For more on this, I spoke with the organization's lead counsel. Kyle Brosnan, Chief Counsel at the Heritage Foundation's Oversight Project. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. Now, the judge overseeing former President Trump's hush money trial just fined Trump $9,000, uh, saying he violated a gag order. I, I want to get your reaction to this. I mean, it's just a, another, another example of the politicized nature of, of Alvin Bragg's case against President Trump. Uh, Trump has to sit in a New York courtroom every day. He can't go around the country and campaign. He's not even allowed to go to his son's graduation here. And, and now the judge is fining him $9,000 for, for speaking about the obvious, speaking of the obvious, like this is a political case, uh, and, and, and speaking about the problems of, of the case. And it's just another example of the weaponized justice system that President Trump is facing. 
Now, your organization seeking records from uh, Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg to, uh, related to, the, to this case. So what are you hoping to find here? Yeah, so we, we are in court against Alvin Bragg on two records requests. The first is uh, records, uh, communications with, uh, we'll call them D.C. Democrats, the Biden White House, the Biden Justice Department, congressional Democrats. And the second is uh, records about all the free and low-cost legal services Bragg's office got from these white shoe international law firms. So one of Bragg's former employees bragged in a book about this, um, that they got all this free legal service. So we're seeking the communications uh, on those two buckets. We, we've had the request in for over a year at this point. Uh, we sent, uh, and we've been in court since last June. Uh, we sent the judge a letter a couple of weeks ago urging you know, quick action on this because Bragg's office has been telling Telling us that they're sifting through hundreds of potentially responsive records and that their IT systems are basically out of date and they can't, you know, go through the records quick enough. So it tells us there's a lot of communications here and it's about time the American people saw those records and understood the political nature of these charges against President Trump. You know, something uh, important is happening tomorrow. EcoHealth's president, uh, Dr. Peter Daszak, is set to appear before members of Congress. Um, he's accused of misleading the U.S. government by doing gain-of-function research in Wuhan, China, without approval. Uh, what should we be looking for in this hearing? So Dr. Daszak previously sat behind closed doors with committee lawyers for, for many hours. And so, uh, as the committee's notice for the hearing says, uh, his statements appear to be inconsistent with what the documents that not only the committee's gotten through their investigation, uh, but also through Freedom of Information Act requests that, that groups have, have gotten and made public. And, and one example is that the uh, EcoHealth purported to do very risky gain-of-function research, basically making a coronavirus that's not able to infect humans capable of infecting humans. They told the government they were going to do that research in North Carolina. However, documents show that they intended to do that research in China, where there's less oversight. And so for tomorrow, Peter Daszak will be under oath in front of Congress, uh, have a chance to, uh, you know, explain his statements he gave to committee staff behind closed door. And this is sort of his last chance to come clean about, about the, the work that his, his group was doing. And, and I just want to broaden this picture a bit. They're also trying to find out everyone related to suppressing the, the uh, lab leak theory. Um, are we going to hear some of that during this hearing? I, I would expect so. Um, the, the committee is honing in on, on members of the scientific community and uh, public health officials like, like Anthony Fauci and Francis Collins. Um, it seems like there were extensive communications between Dr. Daszak and, and Anthony Fauci and NIH officials um, sort of suppressing, to suppress the lab leak theory. A um, the document came out recently joking that, that EcoHealth's nickname amongst the scientific community was EgoHealth because they had such an outsized presence in shaping the narrative here. So I, I would assume those topics to be discussed as well. Kyle Brosnan, thank you so much for your insight here. Thank you for having me. New York Governor Kathy Hochul has issued a statement as pro-Palestinian student protesters stormed and barricaded themselves in Columbia University's historic Hamilton Hall. NTD's Fiona G has the details. New York Governor Kathy Hochul on Tuesday condemned the illegal activities of agitators on Columbia University's campus. She reiterated students' rights to learn and graduate safely. Every American has a First Amendment right to peacefully protest and assemble. But when actions cross over into vandalism, harassment, destruction of property, or even violence, then the line has been crossed. Student protesters stormed the building today. This came as Columbia started to suspend students for ignoring the 2 p.m. disbursement deadline set on Monday. Campus newspaper The Columbia Spectator reported that dozens of students stormed Hamilton Hall, smashed windows, and barricaded doors. Palestinian and Intifada flags have been draped out of the windows of Hamilton Hall. A group called Columbia University Apartheid Divest is demanding divestment from Israel, financial transparency, and amnesty for student demonstrators. Protesters say they will not leave the building until these demands are met. Columbia University issued a statement Tuesday announcing increased security measures. All but one entrance point to campus is closed. No press is allowed on university grounds. Only students living in residential buildings and essential staff members have access to the campus. There is no set end date for these measures. I think it's disgraceful. I mean, you're disrupting the whole 
college campus for a few students they may have valid points or valid uh, concerns but they shouldn't disrupt the whole entire university and and break the law by occupying some of the buildings Columbia is not just made up of a, a small section of people who are protesting. It's a very large campus. And, you know, to have another graduation canceled again yet at Columbia University within the last five years, I think that would be something of a, 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 a tragedy. Multiple institutions have called for police to arrest agitators. Meanwhile, the pro-Palestinian encampment at Yale University peacefully dispersed. Colombia has not yet announced any concrete actions it will take in response to the occupation of Hamilton Hall. Fiona G, NTD News. Despite party divisions, both Republicans and Democrats in the House are showing support for the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. The bill could lower could clear the lower chamber as soon as tomorrow. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more on this story. The Anti-Semitism Awareness Act cleared the House Rules Committee and it is expected to be put to a vote on the House floor this Wednesday. Representative Mike Lawler, the Republican from New York who introduced the bill last October, believes that the legislation would easily pass the House of Representatives but has his doubts whether it will be picked up by the Senate. Once it's passed through the House, it's really on, incumbent upon Chuck Schumer, the highest ranking Jewish official in American history, to act. Uh, and, you know, he's been... Uh, noticeably silent on what is happening on college campuses across America. I spoke with Congressman Adriano Espaillat, the Democrat from New York, and he showed no hesitation in supporting a legislation that would confront anti-Semitism in U.S. campuses. Um, I'm, all, I'm all against anti-Semitism. I got to take a look at the details. I've been a strong supporter of any legislation or any initiative that a fight back against anti-Semitism. I also spoke with Congressman Greg Kassar, the Democrat from Texas, and he was critical of some of the language in the bill, but conceded that he believes that it will pass the House floor with overwhelming support. Criticizing the actions of a government aren't, isn't anti-Semitic. We actually want to criticize anti-Semitism in and of itself, condemn actual hatred, and while also protecting people's free speech rights to criticize any government. The Anti-Semitism Awareness Act would require the Education Department to adhere to the International Holocaust Members Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism when considering what is hate speech. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson went as far as to ask the President of the United States to take a moral stand when it comes to these issues. We desperately need, the country needs clear moral authority. We need the President of the United States to speak to the issue and say this is wrong. It is worth noting that on Tuesday, House Democrats released a statement signaling that they would oppose a motion to oust Speaker Mike Johnson. It is also important to mention that on Tuesday, Chairman of the House Democratic Caucus, Pete Aguilar, was critical of her colleague, Representative Ilhan Omar, over comments she made suggesting that some Jewish students in U.S. campuses were pro-genocide. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. Thank you for watching the Capitol Report. If you want to see our full broadcast, check us out at epochtv.com.